think there is one main thing that the book of Job raises and wrestles with, and is a doctrine called theodicy. T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, theodicy. It actually comes from two words, theo, which is God, and the DC, which comes from the, the Greek word DK, which means justice. And when you put those together, it is actually the defense of God's goodness in the face of the evil that happened around us. The defense of God's goodness in the face of the evil that exists around us. And so, when you read through the book of Job, there are, there are some questions that you will continue to, to hear. How can we claim that God is just when there is so much evil? Can a good God permit suffering? And if God is good, why do people suffer? Why do good people suffer bad things? I think I've shared my, my own story, my own experience several times, but I never knew what it meant to lose someone until I was around 37. No one close to me died before that time. And so between 37 and 39, two years, 2009 to 2011, I had a series of loss that swept my family. My grandfather died January 2009. My father died April 2010. My granny died the same year in August. And my mother died by the next April 2010. 11. A sweep. And there were times when I felt that the loss of these persons in my family and those who were there to lead me along, it, it overwhelmed me. But what happened too was that my own pain was covered by the fact that I was the priest in the family and therefore the responsibility of ensuring that they, had, they were buried with dignity was left up to me. And so all that covered my pain. And I remembered my grandmother who was so dear to me. And, and there were days when I go to the house and I have to just walk away, walk into the, into the bushes and just cry because of the pain, the great pain that I had. And I remember too that for one month I could not preach after my grandmother's death because the pain was too severe and my emotions were uncontrollable. And I, and I can remember my grandmother's eulogy. She asked me to do it. And, and, and I believe it's the heaviest burden I've ever carried. Because I cried from the very beginning to the end. I don't know how the people heard, if they heard anything. The truth is that before that, I believed that I had enough words, adequate words to talk about the goodness of God. But somehow, my pain almost shattered my faith. And so there is the question in the book of Job and the very question that haunts me. Why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? Think about it. Think about the Malaysian airline that went missing. The pain and the agony that left the family. Think about 9-11 in the U.S. Think about the war in Iraq. Think about those people who live in war-torn zones. Think about those who experience violence on a daily basis. 
Think about those whose relatives left them like five minutes, strong and healthy, and then and after five minutes they hear, your relative is gone. Think about the pain and the questions that they must have carried. The book of Job is a very touching book. It's a very inspiring book. It's a drama. It's like its own soap opera. And it deals with the struggles and the pain of people all around. Some people believe that it is, it is a historical book that describes a certain people in a certain era that whose own situations were framed by pain. Some believed. It is the story of a guy, and the guy's name is Job, who was rich and respectable, who was famous and loved, but who faced misfortune. Here is a writer who was searching for answers. When he saw the sufferings of the righteous and the prosperity of the wicked, he was searching for answers. And I can't forget my neighbor who, after Hurricane Gilbert, he, he, he went to the priest and he said, Father, I have a problem. I come to church every Sunday, I plant my, my little field and, 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 and God blew it down. But the man next door who didn't go to church, he's still standing. <laughs> I have a problem. What kind of God is this? We have questions and many of our questions are unanswered. Why is there so much suffering in the world? It's probably not an easy question to answer. It is not. It is not. Because any angle you take, you may find you're, you're losing your argument. Why is there so much pain and suffering? But I feel that instead of answering that question, there are some other questions that we could answer. And the first question is, who is in charge? Who is in charge? This is how the story of Job begins. There was, a, there was once a man who lived in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Oh man, you, you wouldn't need a better recommendation than that. No matter where you go, you will never need a better recommendation than that. And if you notice, all we got from the passage this morning was verse 1 of chapter 1, and then all of a sudden jump to chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. But by the time we get to chapter 2, a lot had taken place. Job had already suffered much. Almost like a horror movie, a lifetime movie or a soap opera. He lost his camels, his sheep, all his possession, his, his servants, and worst of all, all of his children, every single one of them. Everything seemed to be tumbling down. People say when it rains, it pours. It pours. Job's world seemed to capsize and to collapse all around him. Loss after loss, pain upon pain. And there are some people who really said, oh, tough luck. And some would say it's divine punishment. What is that the answer? So in chapter 2, God calls an audience in heaven. And guess who turns up? Satan. Of all people. <laughs> Satan. God calls an audience of his people and Satan turns up. Satan enters the picture which tells us that evil is present. As much as goodness is present, evil is present. What is it that we know about God? We, we always hear things like God is sure, God is faithful, God is powerful, God is 
all present. God knows everything. God is all loving. God is compassionate and understanding. These are things that we know about God. But what is it that we know about Satan? That Satan represents everything that is opposed to God and God's standards. But the truth is, it is God who calls audience. It is God who sits on the throne. It is God who is in charge here. And even though I cannot answer the question about why so much suffering in the world, I think I can still answer the question of who is in charge. Because I know it is God. God is in charge. The second question is the why. And so often we hear it, why? Why, Lord? Why me? Why my family? Why is this happening? Why is it that everything is falling apart? <coughs> and we could continue asking many questions, right? Why do men abuse women? It's, it's a matter of justice, you know. DK, justice. Why do women abuse men? Why do innocent children suffer? And some of us may not know it, but there are a lot of children who are suffering innocently. Why does it seem as if the ends to my life can never meet. The harder I work, is the less I seem to see. Is the more struggle that I seem to go through. And the more is it that I have to pay out. Why? Why is my marriage or my relationship falling apart? Having invested all these years, all I have and all I am into it, why? Why is my family member, my, why are my family members dying of cancer and other deadly diseases? Why is it that I have ruined the children, my children in church, but all of them seem to have neglected the church? Why? And we would continue on and on with the wise. And you know, when you begin to ask yourself why, there are times when you turn the why on yourself. What did I do wrong? And that's a question that Job had to face. What sin did I commit? You know, when you read Psalm 1 and other texts, you, you actually, we are actually told that the righteous shall prosper and the wicked perish. You know that? So how do you hold that in balance with the fact that good people suffer? Listen to Psalm 1. Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the... or lingered in the way of sinners or sat in the seat of the scornful... They are like trees planted by streams of water. Everything they do shall prosper. Wow. The wicked shall not stand upright, nor sinners when judgment comes. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the wicked is doomed. But here it is, what the writer is struggling with is that the wicked are prospering and the righteous are suffering what did I do wrong so you see sinful actions equal punishment and good actions equal rewards what sin did I commit or probably one of the other things that the Bible actually wrestles with is this whole thing about generational curse 
I do something now and my great grandchildren will have to suffer. I don't know about that. I, I don't know if that is the God that I serve. I don't know. But what sin did I commit? The beauty of this drama is that Job's friends, his three friends who came to console him, they were the ones who turned around like the very temptation and looked into Job's face and said, you are suffering because of your sin. How can that be true when we are already set up with the fact that God himself commended Job? This is what God said to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth. A blameless and upright man who fears God and sons evil. No one like him. But here his friends are saying it is your sin. So you see, that question doesn't, it doesn't really answer for us the true picture of this story. Finally, Job loses everything. And before he lost the last of everything he had, he actually said, the Lord gives and the Lord gives. And I love this part. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I wonder how many of us can say that after our loss. But no Job loses everything it seems. His body is now covered with sores. He sits in a heap of ashes in order to cover his sores, to, to put the ashes to soothe the burning of the sores. To comfort himself and he also scrape them because they were itching him terribly. On top of all of that, his wife is the other temptation. She comes and she says, curse God. Because she was so mad with God, curse God and die. Because that's all that's going to happen to you. You're going to die anyway. Everything is gone, even his wife. And this is a transition from a well-respected and prosperous citizen to a poor, sick, dying, and seemingly punished man. Seemingly. He is at the bottom. Life capsizes, it seems. It's as if he had a head-on collision and he's written off by his friends and his wife. They say, it's your sin, Job. And Job is saying, why? How could it be when God is God? The writer is not satisfied with this cultural understanding that God punishes us or cause deadly diseases to come upon us because of our sins. He's not satisfied and neither would I be. This is the same God who said, as far as the east is from the west, is so far I will remove your sin from you. How oh, can we be satisfied? So we, we cannot claim that the devil is in charge because of the evil around us. And we cannot claim that it is our sin that caused these kind of deadly things upon our lives. So what is it then that we have to hold on to? So Job is at rock bottom and all is, but all is not lost. I'm sure there are some of us who have, have had experiences where we felt that we would never live any again. We would have died. Almost that we have gone to death door. Job hit rock bottom, but it. But all was not lost. There is hope. Even though his wife says, curse God and die, there is hope. Job was not at that place. I was talking to one of my former young people when I was a curate, actually. It was like 18 years ago. Um, 
and she said to me, throughout high school and ever since, my life has been in pain over and over again. Lots of situations of my life. Even my very family life with my parents, my siblings just fell apart. And, and, and I carry that pain every day. She said, my mother's door is open for me to go back home, but I cannot go home because of the pain that I'm feeling. And she said, but I need something to hold on to. And, and, and what is it that we're going to hold on to? And I want us to think about it. What is it that we're going to hold on to? If, if sin, our sin is not the answer, and if the devil is not in charge, is, is, is not the answer. What are we going to hold on to? What I realize, the only thing that we can hold on to is simply this. That God trusts us. <laughs> that God believes in us. That is what we're going to hold on to. That's what God needs to do. God trusted Job. It is God's confidence in Job that matters here. I, 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 I never forget the day when my granny gave me my own key. <laughs> I, I, I love that day. I laughed. I, I was just about to go to college, well, I've gone to college for a couple of months and came home and before that she would never give me a key. My boy knew we have to come in by a certain time. <laughs> and I'd have to knock and <laughs> she would have to get up and open that door. And one day she goes handing me a key and said, this is yours. And, and for me, it is not that she said you can come in any time you want, really. <laughs> no. She's saying, I trust you to make the correct decision. I, I, you know why? Because she has lived her life. I mean, she will never sleep until we get home. Never. No matter where you go and whatever time you come in, you go on trips and so, and you come back late, she will never go to her bed until you get home. And she's saying to us, remember that too. Because when you're out there, I'm concerned about you as well in the night. It is trust. It is trust. God trusts us. God believes in us. It's a free will. I remember the man who was blind and when Jesus gave him his sight and, and, and the, the, the Jewish council dragged him to the temple and, and were interrogating him. I said, who did this? And the man said, no, but I was blind. Said, you can't ask me that question. I was a blind man. I couldn't see. I know somebody did it. I don't know his name. And then they, they, they began to tell him, oh, is that man called Jesus who claimed that he's God? And, 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 and he said, you see that he claimed that he's God? I don't care who he is. All I know is that he gave me my sight. That is enough for me to believe in him. You know, that is the kind of trust here that God gave to Job. See, not even the agonizing suffering should take that place of God's trust in our lives. I remember one of my colleagues said, when I was growing up as a young person in the church, as youth, I was president of youth fellowship and I was head of service guild. And he said, you know, I wanted to be like my friends. I wanted to do what they were doing. I wanted to, to be free to sometimes get myself into trouble. And to enjoy life like they did. But he said, you know what? Something always held me back. It is because I know that the people in the church trusted me. And, and why is it felt like a burden sometimes? It liberated me because it saved me. They trusted me. God believes in us. No matter who we are, God believes in us. And, and the point is because God believes in us. We in turn should believe in God. When you read that gospel reading for today, it's about relationships, really. And, and Jesus is calling on, on, on his audience to, 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 to a higher standard of life. 
to raise the bar, the game of their life. So, the question was asked about divorce. And, and, and Jesus' answer simply is, listen, you can't just do what the public is doing. You're different. You're in the church. You have, to, you have to be different. You can't do what the public is doing. You have to honor family life. You have to honor your commitments. And, and then he was talking about the children. And he said, listen, the children are given to you in order for you to protect them and to be there for them and to help them to grow up in society. You have to raise the standards of how you live from those in the world. It means, brothers and sisters, that God trusts us and that's why he gives us those responsibilities. So even at rock bottom, we believe something good is going to happen. Even at rock bottom. Why? Because God trusts us and we, in return, can trust God. I, I, I like the, the, the quote on the, on, on, on the screen. I don't know why terrible things happen to us sometimes, but I have to believe that something good is going to happen. I have to believe that. And you know, that's why Jesus came. So that he can lift us from rock bottom. So that he can take out of the sty of our, the big sty of our hopelessness. So, so that he can lift us up from where we have given up. That's why he came. That's why he tabernacled with us. That's why he took on our flesh. So that he could feel our pain. So that he can bring us out of it. That no wonder the, 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 the writer of the scripture says, by his stripes. Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. He lifts us out of it. So we have no real answers to the sufferings in the world. But we have an answer. That somehow we have a God who believes in us. And he will go to the depths. He will go length in order for us to be who he has made us to be. He trusts us. And that is why you and I should fall down daily and trust him. God believes in us despite our fears and inadequacies. Therefore, we should believe in God because of God's sovereign power and God's goodness and loving kindness. As a church, we're called to mission, to the mission field. And we must become the voices, the advocates of hope. We must become the instruments of justice we must become the servants of peace. And the truth is, there can be no peace without justice. That is what we are called to be in a world that is broken and a world that is full of pain. Even when we carry our own pain. So as we come to the table today, we come to be recipients but we must leave as agents. And there's a quote that I love and I'm going to end with it. It's written by Vance Havener. This is what he says. God uses broken things. And I'm ending with this quote because I want to be conscious that probably, if not all of us, many of us are carrying pains. Many of us are suffering even though we smile. You know, we smile a lot. We carry our own pains and sufferings. He says, God uses broken things. He takes broken soil to produce crops. Broken clouds to give rain. Broken grain to give bread. Broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. It is Peter in his brokenness weeping bitterly who returns to greater power than ever. God uses broken things. We may not be able to answer the question about pain and suffering and brokenness but we can surely say that God trusts us as his people 
And in return, we can trust him. Yes. Amen. Amen.